Welcome back, and we have Tim Alexander, and of course, the near miss solar flare. I pulled, uh, pulled, talk about that news a little earlier in the hour. Tell us what you know, because I, I actually listened to some vi- a video this morning uh, about a special government committee of a, a number of former directors of the uh, uh, CIA, etc., uh, and their concern over this issue. And the fact is, uh, they are doing things about it, but most of them are wrongheaded. Uh, and they don't realize but that you know states like the state of Maine have already proceeded to start hardening their grid. A bill was uh, introduced and passed by the Senate, but blocked by Lisa Murkowski, the Rhino se- Senator uh, Republican from Alaska, back about four years ago in the first part of the term of Obama. Uh, this is very stupid because it would only cost a few hundred million dollars to harden the grid. Because if you lose equipment, uh, the only nation that makes these step-down transformers is China now, and they're not exactly our friend. And we're pulling our international American-based and British-based. European-based companies are pulling business and moving it to India, Indonesia, and elsewhere. So the Chinese economy is almost in what's called zero growth, which is real catastrophic, because they were real superheated. They're not uh, superheated anymore. Yeah, it, you, we, uh, we're, we're getting off the, the, the Carrington event type uh, story here. But, yeah, but, but, the, but the supply chain is, is what I'm as saying. We, as we look towards having a war with China uh, as part of the Third World War, uh, China now makes so much. Uh, you know, this globalization is not something you want to do if you're going to have a global war. But, it, it can't uh, have a war. Anyway. Now, 75% of the chips that go into our aircraft carriers come from China and Beijing. Uh, it's stupid. Uh, we, we don't realize, and Eisenhower made the statement that your supply chain, even your steel, if you export your steel to go to South Korea, uh, if you have your microchips being acquired uh, in microchip factories in Taiwan or in China proper, how the heck can you maintain control, especially if they have a backdoor to be able to use harmonic frequencies to shut off your microchips to run your your power supply on your the reason your that radar Eisenhower your, was uh, Eisenhower the reason that he became so famous is he was a great expert on logistics and right. he understood that war is far more than simply uh, guns and planes and so forth it was the entire process and he he actually led the first uh, a, a group of automobiles, of trucks. It was an army group. Uh, he was, uh, I think, a major at the time from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and they literally had to build bridges as they went. Uh, and it took the U.S. Army to do that. And then, of course, eventually, when he was president, he started uh, the uh, the interstate highway system. Uh, right. A friend of mine, his uncle, uh happened to help a very young uh lieutenant Eisenhower who had a uh Stanley Steamer car one of the first cars he was in northern indiana and his car broke down and uh he was on his way out to texas where he was going to marry uh uh Mamie and um Anyway, he got his, his Stanley Steamer fixed, but he was a he was actually quite a brilliant guy. But he understood uh, all the interrelationships between the supply chain, the logistics chain, the whole bit, and his, his expertise was ultimately on logistics, and that's why he uh, was a, the four star and eventually five star general well, wait, uh, in charge of Europe because we had to get all that logistics. We had to get all the you well, know. Well, that's that's part of your forte is logistics. Of Supplies across that's the Atlantic. Part, Tim, that's part of your, your forte. And all the guests that I have, logistics, military strategy and technology, and the interactions, and how all these on a multi layered chess game really means where you're at. For example, uh, Israel can prosecute a preemptive war, but they can't prosecute a reactive war. Uh, yeah, you know, the thing is that uh, I think we're a lot closer to a peace treaty in Israel than people think. I was reading this morning in, in the North County News. <clears throat> the you know the the paper here for North County San Diego that uh, John Kerry, Zippy Livni and uh, uh, Zayib Arakat from the Palestinians have pretty well closed that the deal will be closed by April of next year, and I think that that's going to happen for a number of reasons. I think the instability in Egypt, Syria, and elsewhere means they have to have a treaty in order to stabilize the situation, because if if they make it unstable enough that Israel has to make a move, which they will. Uh, they'll not only do a simple level attack, it'll be a thermonuclear annihilation, 
which will result in a, in a counterattack that will basically wipe out the state of Israel. It, it, and Israel it's difficult to say you, uh, it's where, where it, exactly everything is going. I'm just predicting, yeah, but, but I'm just saying this is not a prophecy, whatever. This is a, a prediction that I think in the second term of Obama, it's incredibly likely that by next year or the year after, it's the large and longest two years from now, but I think by next year, it's incredibly likely, just because of the world economy and stability, if any war starts with Israel and Syria or Egypt, the Strait of Hormuz will close instantly. Uh, more than one-third of the world's oil supply goes through there. The world economy will completely code, root, code uh, blue cardiac arrest. And we'll be not in conflict with uh, proxy nations like Syria. We'll be in conflict with Russia and China. There, there, uh, there's different, very powerful forces working to create that, and very powerful wor- forces working to prevent it. And uh, it's all part of the dialectic. It's a whirling dervish because it, uh, you, you, get, you know, what's happening in Egypt right now is very bizarre and it can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing uh, and even if it's a good thing it can be a bad thing i mean uh, for instance the treatment of 10 percent of the egyptian population happens to be christians uh, a lot of people they all they were very much in favor of the so-called egyptian revolution but the thing is the old regime protected the christians and now right. you have these uh, this Muslim Brotherhood coming in, and they have not uh, exactly been very favorable to Christians. They've, they, there's been a lot of persecutions of people, and uh, young women that are taken by uh, Muslims and, and taken out of their homes, raped, uh, put into a forced marriage, and they try to escape to go home. Crowds appear outside of their homes, threatening to burn the home down and to kill everybody in it because they're converting Muslim women back to Christianity when the women were no, were never really Muslim. They were just simply pulled out of their house, raped, and, and told you're now married and you're now a Muslim. Right. And uh, that's happened a lot. I, I know Plus they put a fatwa from out the whole family, too. They don't just uh, oh, you know, yeah. they'll raise yeah. the home or the community. So what we're seeing now is that the, uh, and this is smart by the Egyptians, you got to give them credit, the head of the Egyptian military, the head of the new the new uh, Coptic Pope, the head of the moderate Muslim uh, factions in Egypt that want just business and tourism to come back, they all met and said, we got to neutralize these Muslim extremists in uh, Morsi. And Morsi overstepped because he had support for the revolution from young people, but it was not to set up Sharia law, it was to get rid of Mubarak. And he made the assumptions that young people wanted to have a totalitarian state and wanted Sharia law, and they, it was the furthest thing from the truth. The yeah, young the, the, are, the young people are the third force in Egypt. There really right. has been two forces in Egypt. Right. One is the the traditional military government, and they've been uh, you know they've been the beneficiaries of three billion dollars a year in American right. aid. Uh, secondly, is the the Muslim Brotherhood, which was a, a re- deeply uh, connected to the CIA and through the CIA. Uh, the Mossad, even though they're being supposedly vehemently opposed to Israel. But right. the, the third group is all the young people who don't have jobs and who have been uh, negatively impacted by the uh, International Monetary Fund's uh, demands for increasing austerity. Ultimately, and yeah. the mainstream media won't tell you this, but ultimately what's been happening in Egypt is not so much a, a battle pro or for the Muslim Brotherhood. It's a battle uh, because people are are destitute. There, there are no right. jobs. Well, and, what happens is 40% uh, the young people of the are, are, are taking the streets. So yeah. if they present it as merely a battle against austerity fascism, then uh, it's something that could happen in Europe and it's something that could happen in America well, and Australia and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. Uh, exactly. The young people are going to be the deciding factors. They don't want Sharia law. They wanted to get rid of Mubarak. 25 years ago, Mubarak tried to bring in sustainable food for Egyptians. But the European Commission said in the banks, you got to provide us things to exchange. Welcome back. 
back, and um, Tim, there's lots of other news going on, and uh, let's let's kind of foray into it. Uh, you know, all the way from the recent vote between Democrats and Republicans, with believe it or not, more Democrats voting against the NSA spying bill. So surprises, Chris Christie voting for uh, Daryl Issa, who's my local district, voting for more spying, as if that's going to help make Americans safer. Um, we have uh, the bond market, the federal government, and the judges pushing to actually block lawsuits but to, to prevent the bailing in of people's pension funds, which is totally illegal. Uh, another way of extending this uh, you know, Bank of England uh, U.S. Treasury plan, which is bailing in, which they did in Cyprus, uh, we've got the war in the Middle East is, in a sense, on hold because basically Russia said, yet it's not going to happen. I think basically uh, Russia is saying, we don't want this to happen, but we want to have peace treaty. And the real issue, I think, is the Saudis pulled the plug on the Morsi regime, even though they're a brotherhood, because they knew that the martial law was going to break down peace with Israel. And Israel, if worse comes to worse, they're going to nuke every Muslim nation within seven thousand uh, the miles. Saudis, the Saudis put in a uh, billion dollars to take out Morsi. Right. And they, they did it, by the way, while Obama was still pushing Morsi as the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, following a speech, by the way, in the first term of his, his presidency, the usurper in chief, trying to push that, that, you know, their version of the Muslim Brotherhood was going to be well, the solution. I, I think the key to the, uh, to the generals uh, basically saying that's it uh, with Morsi was uh, two weeks before they overthrew him. Uh, he basically uh, started making noise uh, in total support of the uh, the the rebels uh, in Syria, and he was calling on people to uh, to rise up and to uh, you know to join the rebels, and uh, that's not something the generals really wanted to see. Uh, this whole thing in Syria is an outsider thing, and while it's got a lot of support from the Saudi and the Omanis, uh, a lot of the Arabs realize the real danger to this, that uh, it, it, it could ignite the whole Middle East. Yeah, and they're, they're happy to see the fact that Russia has came in and said, uh, if you cross this line, uh, we're going to give you a whipping. And yeah, China exactly. has said uh, basically the same thing. Yeah, so, the, two, the two toughest people on earth, and I've said this before, so people, including foreign officials, should listen are Syrians and Russians. Syrians and Russians, get that straight. You will never win against Syria or Russia, even if you Well, the them. Syrians have showed themselves to be extremely tough and, and very good fighters, but, you know, they're on their soil fighting for their country. Right. And, and they, uh, the, the, the Saudis have too. taken people that they were going to execute for rape and for, for murder, and they said, here's your AK-47. You've got a choice. We'll chop your head off in a public square, or we'll give you some money, and you can go kill people in, in Syria. And right. uh, they, you know, they they have the many of the people that have have gone into Syria are bloodthirsty mercenaries that are being paid, and uh, you know, they go in, they rape people, they kill people, right, left, women, children, right. and so forth, and, and and the people that are right. fighting for their lives say, look, that's it, we're not giving yeah. an inch, we're going to kill yeah. these so-and-sos, uh, or they're going to kill us, and this is our country, and my home, and my territory, and you know, and no, we'll fight, Tim, and if we have to, we'll die. And yeah, Tim, uh, you, you, they're you, being very you, tough. You, By the way, the U.S. Okay, here's, here's a little fact right, before we, I, I've, I've got it on my computer screen here, and I, right. I want to mention it. The U.S. economy has grown by $1.3 trillion, while the stock market has grown by $12 trillion. Um, Wow. And yeah. what period of time? Like well, a year or two years? You, you, what you have is uh, a stock market that has been inflated by uh, the Federal Reserve. And, uh, you know, they keep pumping all this money into the market. And right now, the, the whole world's economy is uh, it, it, it's just uh, waiting to explode. The balloon ready to pop. Let, yeah. let me just throw a real rat on the table right now. I just got this from Dredge. Dozens of CIA operatives on the ground during Benghazi attack. Now they tried to they tried to Benghazi they tried to Libyanize Syria. It ain't gonna happen. It's one people, not eighteen different tribal groups. 
uh, even the Christians and the Sunni Muslims, everybody was at the table uh, dealing with uh, with the, uh, the the Shiites, which are the the Alawite leaders. Nobody was excluded from the uh, from the table dealing with uh, the uh, the current ruling group in in Syria. The problem that's that's going to happen is any more intervention there means a peace treaty is so imminent. This situation in Benghazi where there were literally 67 plus missiles given, ground air missiles, which are like stinger missiles, given to the Al-Qaeda terrorists. And the reason why he was there without a proper contingency to protect himself was simply he was trying to get the missiles back. And they did this on purpose. They made sure they blocked. But here's the latest. CNN uncovered exclusive new information about what allegedly happened at the CIA in the wake of the Benghazi terror attack. Now, four Americans, including Ambassador Stevens, were killed in an assault by armed militants. Uh, sources now tell CNN uh, people working in the CIA were on the ground that night, and the agency is going to great lengths to make sure, uh, you know, in other words, they're covering it up as to what really happened there. So uh, this situation is getting uglier and uglier. Well, uh, I, I think what they wanted was, was before the election, they wanted uh, something that would benefit uh, Obama. And that kind of blew well, you're talking about the blind shake thing, yeah. I, I've heard yeah, that story. Now, being... now, they're, now it's being used to try to take Obama down by forces that probably are upset with Obama no, because he no, is drugged. No, no, let me, let me read the rest of the letter and you can get to so make an opinion after that. Sources now tell CNN dozens of people were working on the CA were on the ground and that the agency is going to great lengths to make sure it, whatever it was doing remains a secret. CNN has learned the CIA is involved in what one source calls an unprecedented attempt to keep the spy agency's Benghazi secrets from ever leaking out. And since January, some CIA operatives involved in the agency's mission in Libya have been subjected to frequent, even monthly polygraph exams, according to a source with deep knowledge of the agency's work. Uh, workings, and uh, it has been described as pure intimidation with the threat that any unauthorized CIA employees who leak information could face the end of his or her career. In exclusive communication obtained by CNN, one insider says, you don't jeopardize yourself, you, you, you jeopardize your family as well. Another says, if you have no idea the amount of pressure being brought to bear on anyone with knowledge of this operation, agency employees typically are polygraphed every time, three or four years, never more than that said former CIA operative and CNN analyst Robert Bayer. In other words, the rate of the kind of polygraph lens is rare. And uh, it says here, if uh, somebody is being polygraphed every month or one or two months, it's called an issue issue polygraph, and that means the polygraph division suspects something. So uh, what's really going on here is Obama knew, State Department knew, they're trying to get the missiles back, and they made sure there was nobody there to rescue them. By the way, they're, yeah. uh, before we go, they're closing several embassies and consulates, so U.S. embassies uh, this Sunday uh, for security fears, and they'll be closed for several days uh, all Where? over the kind of world. Really? Clean because it's human war hybrid. That's why the ancient world proscribed against eating pig. Welcome back, and um, we have Chris Harris. Uh, Chris, we talked earlier about the disaster, what's going on, and we're going to post up these articles that you sent me. Uh, let's summarize what's happening at the Fukushima nuclear waste generation site. Yeah, that, and it is a, a waste generation site. Um, if, if I were to design a uh, waste generation site with no off switch, it would have to be Fukushima. And I'll, I'll give you just a just to give up some first-hand information. A friend of mine uh, uh, lives in uh, lives in that area, and actually, it's second-hand because uh, he, not him because he's living in a different area. But in the Fukushima area, the children have to wear masks to go outside or they don't go outside without masks they they mostly do indoor activities that's that's a horrible way to live so you know that that's what's going on right there also um i know i'm getting an echo do you, are you still there no i can hear you really well go ahead okay very good. okay sorry yeah very good and then so um 
they're finding that there's a lot of cesium everywhere they dig. They're trying to put in. Remember, do, and it all it all really just ties together. Let me just say there were problems with electrical br- uh, buses and breakers that they had. They were sitting out and they and, you know, they were losing cooling and and uh, so they're trying to rectify that by burying some of the cables and installing them properly. They're finding that when they when they uh, uh, do when they do bury the cables, they're finding cesium and all kinds of uh, uh, nuclides that they didn't. Have to encounter, and so um, you know the, the situation. Is are they surprised, or they are they embarrassed? Which which is the emotion? Well, <laughs> are they surprised or they? I, I would I say they're the, both. They're surprised because now everybody knows that they had to zip to stop this disaster, and it's form of a radiological castration of future generation of humanity. And already in Japan, people need to realize this, the rate of stroke and vascular disease went up 3,500%, which means people didn't live long enough to get cancer. They got endothelial wall damage caused by the radionuclides, the same as Chernobyl, where most of the people from that graphite nuclear reactor died. And by the way, it's still leaking like crazy with a giant sarcophagus over it. Uh, And that radiation uh, level from Japan is increasing, not decreasing. We have a disaster that literally is going to sterilize the human population so human beings a generation from now only if they're insane or don't mind taking care of a disabled child if the child lives will uh, have children and they'll have to be submitting their gametes to a federal or global authority to be able to see if they can produce a child by non-wild reproduction which will be against the law yeah, and, That's where and we're going. some of the physiological, not just uh, mental, but physiological uh, problems that these poor children are going to have are going to be just unbelievable. When you when you look at the pictures of, for instance, uh, in Iraq from the uh, depleted uranium usage on the shells, uh, some of these poor babies, oh my God, it's just horrific. Uh, by the way, yeah, they're, they, they're now finding the, the deeper they go, like b- b- uh, below Fukushima number one plant, the greater the uh, cesium levels are in the water. And they, right. they're sampling 40 feet below the surface now, and they're, they're getting more the deeper they go. Right, but what's happening, that there's, there's three things happening that are particularly scary. The first is the tritium concentration is increasing. The second is they don't know where it is. And the third is it's venting under the ocean and into tunnels in the rocks all the way to, to northern Tokyo. Plus it's venting out into the open ground into the troposphere, the atmosphere. So that's why we're still seeing surges of radiation. I just watched in the last few days. It surged just for a matter of minutes, but it surged up to four times background. And then it drops back to two times background. But we had a period back in the spring where it was three to four times background plus up to five times background for several months. So You're talking about where you live in Southern California? Yeah, and we have, by the way, we get less radiation than people think, oh, we're getting a lot here. No, no, no. It doesn't rain here. Rain is when it comes down. It's hitting higher mountain areas like in Idaho. It's hitting in Vermont. It's hitting in Serbia probably higher than it is here. And if people in the Southern Hemisphere want to be arrogant, it crosses the trans-equatorial uh, air currents that carry 300 times more water is carried in high atmospheric, uh, super uh, trans-equatorial jet currents that travel at up to 300 miles per hour and they they actually carry those toxic radioisotopes to the southern hemisphere too so they happen in surges they don't happen continuously happen in surges chris uh, let's let's get back into the, some of the details how bad is fukushima and are they actually going to start taking like a, a military action like in other words a strategic action where we bring american and international forces in there start trying to contain the radiation so it doesn't spread stop allowing it to be filtered and then just releasing plutonium uh, cesium-134 which by the way displaces uh, magnesium from the you know the phytoplankton in the pacific ocean and between that and the uv shock happening because the sun's putting more uv b c and d the increased geoengineering of the upper atmosphere and the decrease in the magnetic field we're basically about to see the death of the pacific ocean and it could take a while but in the meantime, the bioaccumulation is going to be devastating to the population. It's been calculated by public health officials, that not including babies, but just children and adults. It's estimated that Fukushima Daiichi has killed 20,000 Americans prematurely. 
that's the numbers, the conservative numbers. The death rate on a neonatal intensive care unit in Pennsylvania within six weeks of Fukushima rose by over 40%. So what people need to start realizing is you don't live long enough to get cancer. You die of a stroke or heart attack or you get the onset of, of other illnesses that you don't directly connect to Fukushima because the radiological stressor can cause many other illnesses including laying the groundwork for a worldwide plague by reducing the uh, T killer cell activity that will protect you against viruses and bacteria. So we've got weak and herd immunity, we've got increased in disease level, we've got increasing radiologically induced trisomic early miscarriages, we've got uh, death of premies in intensive care nurseries, and we have the weakening of the elderly and the other parts of our population. When two emerging airborne plagues are likely to hit her in the fall after the Hajj, when the two and a half to three million uh, people return from Saudi Arabia, Mecca, Medina, and where we are already seeing some evidence that there may be some cases already here of H7 and 9 that's 18 times more lethal than the 1918 plague. So tell us the summary what are they doing and are they going to do anything? Are they even asking the right questions? Let me just let me just go stick to the hardware side right now and go back to what uh, Sunichi Tanaka, the head of the Japanese Nuclear Regulatory Agency, uh, has said and verbalized that he's lost all faith in TEPCO's ability to do anything about it. And uh, then he's gone on to say, if you got a good idea, we'd like to know too because we don't really know what to do. And that's ba- you know that's basically what. But my big concern was we've never really planned for such a contingency, and we're still not planning for it. It's not really in any of the plans that we're trying to do to beef up and bolster up a militarized-type effort, as you spoke of. I, I, I didn't want to think of it as a military. I'd think of it as more of an emergency response organization. Um, but we're, we're not really discussing areas that need to be discussed, like, well, what happens if all of your uh, plans to to uh, prevent core damage or anything, or, or uh, containment failure. What if they What if they don't work? What about What about the cleanup or the uh, strategy to contain? And that's obviously that needs to be addressed. It's yeah. not really being addressed yet. Well, We're falling short that, in that area. Yeah. Let's use our imagination and resummarize what we've done over the last. Uh, it's two and a half years now. Yeah. Number one, they need a corium catcher, which we talked about putting containers lined with depleted uranium under it was using core uh, tunneling machines. Probably using the type of core tunneling machines I've talked about. They're not like the channel one that they built a tunnel, a tunnel under the British uh, English Channel. But the kinds are called sulfur uh, nuclear reactors with the, uh, with the impact lasers that actually can move at miles per day. We need to put a, a seawall up and we need to be able to convert the liquid waste and solid nuclear we need to stop just filtering out selectively and stop dumping plutonium cesium and other radioisotopes directly in the pacific ocean or putting into leaky containers we need to have ground penetrating radar and drones over top looking down as to where the heck the corium is and then monitor nuclear reactions and core critical want to wrap up and get your answer uh, Chris so all these things including aquarium catchers ground penetrating radar radiation detectors uh, just radiation mapping knowing where the hell aquarium is and seeing if there's criticality they're now putting liquid glass down there it's going to cause what's called a a called a neutron flux it's going to increase along with the increasing levels of tritium a reflexance of slow neutrons that increases the chances of major I mean major nuclear explosions. If you actually look at the amount of radioisotope that's down there, and the chances of not only a zirconium-induced hydrovolcanic explosion, but a true critical hydrovolcanic explosion triggering off, just like crytrons and fast, switch, uh, fast switches, and plastique is used in the older-style nuclear weapons that compresses and causes a critical mass. What we have is these people are literally creating the largest bomb in human history by turning Fukushima not just into a waste site, but into a giant enveloped in liquid glass, increasing tritium presence, lava lamp of nuclear decimation. That's what they're doing. And it's so crazy just waiting for Mount Fuji, which is reloading its magma chamber, which is about to blow, and they're monitoring it like crazy. The number of level 5 plus earthquakes since March 11th of 
two years and a half years ago has increased by 500%. So anybody out there, by the way, who thinks that it was triggered off by just a tectonic weapon alone, you got to have the background energy present. But, yeah, there's some pretty good energy uh, evidence. We talked about this with Professor McCanny without the proper P waves and so on, that Fukushima Daiichi was an artificially induced, uh, if you want to call it tsunami, and that, in fact, it was tsunami is what broke the reactor core at reactor number one, which is literally sitting on top of a fault line. That's how crazy this is. And um, we're in the pipe, we're in the tailpipe of this damn mess, and our government, our president, our agencies, and our senators won't respond even to our questions. When I contacted Senator Wyden and Senator Feinstein here in California, when I contacted Senator Congressman Issa, who I otherwise like, he wouldn't sit with me. He wouldn't answer my questions. He would have a functionary of his office talk to me. And I knew I was talking to some student who missed that class, who doesn't <laughs> understand, who doesn't didn't understand a radioisotope, or when I talked to the so-called nuclear expert uh, for Senator uh, Feinstein's office. He was obviously a young person who hadn't got a clue and tried to quote off how the radiation network was working so well. And I said, well, how come they closed them all? And these beta radiation networks are not being properly operated, and they're not giving sampling of air, food, water, or what I call plume trail analysis in real time to give us an idea of a jet that's passing through a radiologically high-intense plume or doing a chain of custody on an Dr. Bill, uh, Bill, i got to tell you this. I used to have several friends that worked for senators in Washington when we were in college. Right. And the stories, the feedback I used to get, I mean, the place is a zoo. And uh, I, I, a good buddy of mine who was a congressman and on the House Armed Services Committee, I used to, when we were younger, we used to go out and get drunk uh, several times a week. Uh, I was a consultant to an aerospace firm, and I, I, I went to him with some information uh, because we could have resulted in a plan in his district. And uh, the expert that he had uh, on uh, military technology was a, a young woman, and I swear she didn't know which end of the rifle a bullet came out of. That's and crazy. She, and he was on the House Armed Services Committee. Right. And I mean, it, so when you, what you're describing is unbelievable, but it's every day in Washington. I, I, listen, I worked as a, as, as a point man under Reserve Admiral John Hughes because he didn't know anything about infectious disease. And I worked with Operation Top Off and Dark Winter in 97 with the FBI and CDC director for the nation. So Deagle's been on the inside, okay? So when I hear people who want to dissuade Deagle's and not, Deagle's this and Deagle's that, Deagle's lots of things, but I'm not a liar. What they need to understand is I'm, I feel adequate. Unfortunately, most people either there are cowards or they're smart as a bucket of rocks. And they're afraid to ask good questions because they don't need to, I tell people, for God's sake, don't believe anything I say. Go do your own research, but at least ask good questions. And then don't use your spittle and think, well, if I can get rid of the messenger, the problem will go away. No, the tiger outside your little hut is still smells your flesh, can still salivate, and you'll still hear him rumbling with that little of a tiger ready to eat you and comes to the side of your grass hut. So the fact is the public are malevolently and viciously ignorant and they, they want to attack the messenger. And when we ask these damn politicians to do even a modicum of their job, even to tell us how radioactive our fish is, our water, even our seaweed, when the bluefin tuna comes back and the University of California, San Diego comes out and says within 90 days, oh, by the way, 100% of your bluefin tuna are hopping, electro, <laughs> hopping radioactive. So, Chris, what are your, what's your comment on this? I mean, I, I, I'm constantly, I think I can't get shocked from week to week when I do these updated reports with you. Yeah. But each week, it gets more out of control. It's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, this, oh, my God. Good, it's always set up to take on a life of its own, and, and no one is really driving the bus or... Maybe that maybe that's intentional or, or whatever. But oh, no, they're, no, no, they're, really no, they're taking their hands off the bus wheel, but they have a bunch of people with duct tape duct taping the gas pedal to the floor. Yeah, it's even worse than you're right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm always shocked to uh, to see that uh, really those that are supposed to be the uh, collective wit really really aren't, and they're the ones calling the shots. And uh, that, that really goes down to they're serving a different master. I really, it goes back to Well, that. No, I let, 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 what we have to do is we have to discern 
I learned this in emergency many years ago. And I, I like to coin her, I call sarcastic, uh, uh, iconoclastic terms. One of them is there's an accident or on purpose. And I used to tell the nurses this in the trauma and the emergency rooms. I say, most of what we see is not an accident. 98% is a non-purpose. If someone has had a flask of vodka and they're drinking it straight with their feet hanging out the window at 110 miles an hour and they're coming around a corner and lose control and end up in the trees, that's not an accident. If someone decides to go up on a roof and do work on their roof without a safety harness, that's not an accident. Uh, when someone elects politicians who are totally sold out to, and this doesn't even, by the way, protect the nuclear industry, and I'm saying this because we're about to have what's called UV shock of our phytoplankton and our benthic layer of our oceans. We're about to see the death of the forests, the death of the grassy plants, like it says in the Bible. And in fact, there is a day coming, and I can't tell when it'll be, but it's coming, when if you go during the middle of the day, you're going to either go blind, develop a pterygian, get second degree or worse burns in your skin just because you're out for 15 minutes in the midday sun. Now, people think that's ridiculous. It's already there. Yeah, we're going to have UV and B detectors you can get yourself and test at less EMF. We have UVC detectors now. You can go to all these sites that Ann will talk about tomorrow, and we're going to post them all up, all these different link sites for the government. So you don't need to accept Deagle's opinion. Look at it yourself, and you'll see level 11, 12, 13, 16. Oh, my God, levels of ultraviolet light. This is not compatible with the carbon oxygen cycle taking CO2 and turning it back through nice, happy plants into oxygen. If your oxygen goes, and, no more ozone and, layer, but, but no more Bill, ozone layer, is, no more life on Earth. You know this, and our viewers know, our listeners know this, but the people that are in a position to do something about it in Congress and in the various parliaments, they it's not on their radar screen because what's on their radar screen is how do I make enough money to get myself reelected? How do I well, serve this interest well, they're, they're and that interest? They sent down Sophia two weeks ago, and we talked about this with John Moore. Uh, it's one of the many things that they're doing to monitor the approach of the red dwarf star. And I can't tell you when it's coming, so don't expect me to tell you, but I, they've been monitoring it coming in since the, the 70s with the Pioneer 10. This comet, they have discovered another comet, by the way, in early January, that's like the ISON. The ISON comet is coming from the deep Oort cloud, which means it was shoved in by something big deep in the Oort cloud, which is about point seven light years out into space around the solar system when you see these comets coming in and there's another one they discovered another big one and of course according to professor mccann he thinks it's a lot bigger they're trying to say as little as a kilometer come on you're not going to see it 16 times brighter than the moon in a kilometer this is probably according to professor mccann 2600 kilometers i don't know but what it is is a sun grazer and two weeks ago we had a cme that was of the order of the Carrington event of 1859, and if that had hit us, bye-bye satellites. You wouldn't be hearing us because bye you bye. wouldn't have any electricity. Yeah, bye-bye satellite, bye-bye communications networks, bye-bye power grid. Bye-bye refrigerator, bye-bye running water, bye-bye sewers, bye-bye air conditioners. Hello, road war. How, how about uh, hello, Vigo Mortensen and the road? <laughs> And the kids saying to, because it would fry your electronics on your cars. Actually, the cars are the last to go because they're grounded by them being on tires. The cars are the last. If the cars go, everything else is already gone. <laughs> and, of course, Viggo Mortensen's son said to the stranger, Do you eat people? That's his first question, not what's your name. Pray, repent. We're going to have an intervention, but it requires us to repent first. Back tomorrow.